Well, Genesis chapter 4, I'd like to read verses 1, let's say through uh, 7, then we'll pray. Now Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, this is a very um, kind of an iconic passage of scripture, it's well known, uh, or at least it's it's familiar to us. The the general uh, flow of events and what happens, and uh, we pray now that you'd open it up to us, just as we sang, that you would speak to us. Um, open our hearts and our eyes to see uh, the message that's here for us, that no uh, truth would go uh, without understanding, without being received, and helping us as it's meant to do. I pray that you'd uh, help us all to give attention to the Word, to sit under it as disciples, and... Um, to be transformed by it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to speak to you a little bit um, before we get started um, about the need for a very careful reading of this section, just to remind you of that, how important it is, how much really is here that we're, we quickly kind of just skim over because we don't read carefully with attention as one seeking to be instructed and to learn something. Um, we know the story and so we breeze through it, take it on to other material and maybe perchance something would grab our attention as we read that we hadn't noticed and we think about it but we don't usually get into the mode of careful reading um, when we go through this kind of a story. And I just want to urge you uh, in that regard. Um, the title for today's message is the, the Two Offerings, the Two Worshippers, and God's Pleading with Cain. The Two Offerings, the Two Worshippers, and God's Pleading with Cain. Now, just by, again by way of introduction, the need for us to pay careful attention to the words that we have um, really, it's, it's so important because what we have here is such an, an incredibly concise account. Um, it's a concise, you might say, a narrative, and that's certainly not wrong to call it a narrative, but I hesitate even to do that because when we hear narrative, we think story, which is right, and when we think story, we kind of disengage, we throttle it down, and we just kind of read on through and get the main flow of thought and think that we've got it. And if we do that here, um, we're going to run into problems. Um, usually we hear narrative and we, there's kind of a deadening of our senses. It turns us off almost, disengages us from being careful learners and hearers. But in this chapter, chapter 4, Moses is out to teach incredibly powerful truths, incredibly helpful truths. And he's, meant, he's out to do it in very impactful ways. One of the best ways to convey certain truths about the real world we live in 
if you're trying to convey some truths to your child or something, what would you do? One of the best ways would be to carefully select the, the best examples you can think of, the most effective examples you can think of, and then tell them in masterful ways. And this is exactly what Moses does. He selects just a few stories for over hundreds and hundreds of years and tells them in incredibly pointed ways. Um, also, um, in this vein of thinking, there's this need for us to be good and attentive readers. Um, part of that, I would say, is the ability to learn from being shown and not just from being told. What I mean is, um, we have to be able, as we read these things, to learn something from seeing it shown to us rather than being told to us. Um, we cannot insist we be told everything plainly. Sometimes it is far more effective to be shown. Now, I don't mean to tell you this so that I can kind of put in pet doctrines and say, well, they're there even if they're not said. I don't mean that at all. I simply mean to make you more alert, make you more careful. That the author here, Moses, may very well be trying to show you truths rather than just tell you truths all the time. Because very often that's more effective. For instance, let me, rem let me tell you this, and this will just maybe show you how effective it is to show truth instead of just tell truth. So far in Genesis 1 through 4, we have yet to be told one time in the Bible that God is good. It's never told us that. Not one time. But we have seen it with our own eyes in the way he has handled Adam and Eve, the way he responded to Satan, the way he, th he made good on his punishments. We've seen it that he's good. We've never been told that he's powerful. But we've been shown it when he spoke the world into existence. But we've never been told that God is powerful at all. And if you're waiting on the Bible to tell you these things, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss so much. We've never been told that God is loving, or that He's just, or even that He's the one in charge. I mean, He has a name that says He's kind of the sovereign, but we've never been told that He actually is sovereign. How do you know He's not a pretender like Satan said He was? Because you've been shown. And there's much that we're shown here about Cain that we're not necessarily told. We're shown things about Abel that we're not necessarily told. So as we head into this portion of Genesis, we need to have a few things on our minds. First, we've got to remember that Moses is still teaching us what became of the world as it was wonderfully created by God in order, what happened in order to get it now into this disjointed, evil, sorrowful, painful, prideful place. What happened to the first creation as God made it as it left his hands how did things end up so twisted and changed now as we do this if you're thinking about that you're asking you're reading this narrative kind of tuned in to certain things you're looking for changes from one thing to the next you're looking for new developments in the story for signs of a growing rift between God and man of an increased alienation on the part of man from God how did we go from Genesis 1 as God's vice regents in a peaceful and fruitful creation in fellowship with God to now a pagan, evil, hateful humanity striving against both ourselves and God and even the earth itself? How did that happen? And so you're looking for these things. You're asking. You're saying, I, he still hasn't answered my questions. We're still not there. What I mean is, if you get to the end of Genesis 3 and you say, okay, there's the answer, I mean, is that really the answer? Is, is in your mind, the only difference is between what God made in Genesis 1 and what we experience now, the fact that we die and that childbirth is hard and that husbands and wives have difficulty getting along at times and that work can be hard. Is that basically it? Otherwise, we're just doing fine? Or is there something more that's terribly wrong in the world? Well, there's a lot more that's wrong. Much more has changed. And so Genesis 4, then, is this continued answer that Moses gives about the continued fall of man away from God, 
this detrimental slide that man goes on, this greater corruption that comes into the world and into humanity, and it's explained by Moses in this section. And so we're looking for that. We're looking, okay, I, I see some of these other things that have happened, but what about my neighbors? I mean, what about the people I live with? They're wicked, they're evil, what's happened? Here's God's answer. And so you're looking, and as it begins to describe the events of these people, you're looking for these changes. So now that we're alert to all of this, paying careful attention to the stories we read and the details that are told, we might ask, well, what are, what are we learning here? And I think Moses, his, effort, his intention is to show us um, about uh, what went wrong by showing us how quickly things headed south and how radically they headed south. How quickly it happened and how radically it happened. How just, what a remarkable extent men have become worse. Now then, what have we seen so far? Um, we've considered Cain and Abel a little bit last time. We considered that Cain, here he was, gotten of God. This loved, hoped for, Son, this man, who, this son who was going to grow up to be a man, and oh, what would he be? He, we've gotten what God has said we would have. And then it wasn't long, or maybe it was long, and we come to this other son, Abel, and she names him Vanity, just a breath, a fleeting, of no account. We considered their different occupations. Cain, a worker of the ground, Abel, a keeper of the sheep, a keeper of livestock. Now then, um, where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us right into the story where we see here in verse 3, In the course of time Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. And we hear that, and we ask this question, well, why was Cain rejected? I mean, when you read it, in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. Well, what's wrong with that? And Abel brought... Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. What's wrong with that? Nothing. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. And so we wonder why. And there's a lot of different views on this. Why was the offering rejected? But the most popular by far are the two that I will now mention, but they're two that I disagree with. First of all, the most I think the most common view on this is that the reason Cain's offering, Cain and his offering were rejected, were because it was a bloodless offering, that he made a bloodless offering. That the fault lies in a bloodless attempt at atonement. One thing, you know, if we're thinking they're coming to present an offering and Cain, you know, and Abel both have sinned and they come and make a sacrifice to God to atone for their sins and he came without blood and so he's rejected. I don't think the text will warrant that conclusion. Also, some of the people here will say it wasn't just that he came and it wasn't that he came to offer a sacrifice without blood, it's that he came to, to God in any way without blood. He came to make an offering to God, but he didn't accompany it with blood. You don't even approach God without blood. Some will say that. Again, I don't think that's the, the point of the passage. I'll, I'll argue for this, but then the second most common view here is that it was only a heart issue, that the fault lies merely in a wrong attitude of the heart. Otherwise, the, the actual offering was just fine. Nothing wrong with his offering. He brought of uh, the fruit of the ground. Nothing wrong with that. But his heart was wrong, and we see that worked out in the passage. This text, this view has a little bit of merit, but ultimately I think it fails. I would submit that both these ideas are wrong, and I want to suggest another route. Um, I'm certainly not alone in my view. Um, 
I would say I, I didn't come to it in a settled way until I read uh, uh, Bruce Waltke's take on all this, and he's got the same view I have on this passage. Um, and I found him very helpful in kind of solidifying my own take on it, but uh, um, I was really close to where I am now, and that um, is that both, it wasn't just Cain that was rejected, it was Cain and his offering, and it was Abel and his offering that were accepted. Consider verse 5 and what's here. This is the reason I didn't like these other views. Verse 5, uh, sorry, verses uh, 4 and 5, the end of verse 4, and the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. Both things are mentioned. In a, in a passage where, where um, the economy of words is, has a high priority, we're told that both Abel and his offering were accepted and that both Cain and his offering were rejected. And for me, I just felt like I've got to find a way to, sh to understand both things being accepted, both things being rejected in the various cases. We ought to be looking both to the offerers and the offerings to see why they were accepted and rejected. So first, let us consider the offerings of the two men. As we do this, we should start by considering, I think, this the word itself, as that's, I think, in this instance, particularly enlightening, to understand the word. Um, so what sort of an offering do we have here? As we look at this word, let me kind of back up and talk about words that refer to offerings in the Old Testament. The Old Covenant arrangement between God and Israel, if you think about it, the whole Old Covenant arrangement, of which this book of Genesis is the first of their holy books, written by Moses, the one who gave them that law and that arrangement. That whole system was centered around the tabernacle of God with its offerings and its sacrifices and its festivals, which were to be administered by the priests, both for and with the people. We should not be surprised then to learn that the vocabulary within the Old Testament documents contain a rich variety of words used to describe these actions and these offerings. That there's lots, of, there's a whole list of vocabulary words you might think of uh, that all refer and pertain to these various kinds of offerings and how they're used, how they're understood. Now as I understand it, the most broad term for an offering in the Old Testament is one you might, have, you might be somewhat familiar with, this word korban. Korban, whatever, which is taken from this root, which means to bring near. And the idea is to have something and to bring it to God, to, to, to devote it to Him, to give it to Him. And that's not the word that's used in our passage, but it's, it's one of these words, things that are brought near. There were generally kind of two sorts of offerings in the Old Covenant. There were voluntary offerings and involuntary ones. Um, I don't mean that uh, you wouldn't have any choice at all. You could always choose not to bring in a bring an offering, but some offerings were required of you by law, and others were you were free to give or not give as you saw fit, or to give whatever you chose. It wasn't required that you give a certain thing. Some of these were required of you. Again, others were a voluntary sort of offering. Involuntary offerings, ones that were required, were generally those that made atonement and involved the shedding of blood for the removal of sin. Think of the sin offering, the guilt offering. These are emphatically not the words that are used in our story. They're not the words that we find here. It was not a guilt offering. either. In the, in the, you don't have the word used here for a guilt offering or for a sin offering. And in the context, it doesn't appear that way. And I'll, and I'll it, it, draw that out here in a little bit. But in the context, it doesn't appear as a guilt offering either. Now, voluntary offerings. These had their own words as well. Burnt offerings, there's a certain word for that. Meal offerings, there's a certain word for that. Fellowship offerings, there's a word for that. Um, uh, votive offerings, free will offerings, these all have their own words. Some of these could be animal offerings. These ones that were voluntary, they weren't for someone's sin, they weren't for your sin, you offer an animal. Some of them were you just offer grain or something else. Other times, you could. some of these you could offer either an animal 
or grain. You could take your choice, whichever one you wanted you could offer. Animals were not only offered to atone for sin and for guilt. Sometimes they were just an expression of your gratitude and your thanks to God. The Genesis stories, which happened before the time of Moses, were generally told, I would just say this as a general matter of, of uh, reading, reading your Bible, the Genesis stories, even though they happened before the time of Moses, as Moses wrote them, he usually told these stories using language that fits his own time and which would appear later in the law. So when you have here this word that says this offering that they brought, well, that's a word that Moses uses elsewhere for a certain kind of offering as well in the law. And the, the word is the meal offering, the grain offering. That's what we're talking about. They came and presented a grain offering. Is in its most technical sense in terms of the uh, Old Covenant sacrificial system, this was the grain offering. So then what kind of is striking, or at least in terms of just the word itself, is that Abel brought an animal. Because it kind of seems like, well, Cain's the one who brought of the fruit. I mean, he's the one who brought the produce. And Abel brought this animal. Seems like Cain would be reject, Cain, or Abel would be rejected. He's the one who messed up the offering and got it all wrong. It, it would appear. Um, <laughs> but then we might ask, well, how is it used in the rest of the Old Testament? Are there other ways that this word, this grain offering word, is used? Well, most people think that this word comes from, and this is maybe not important to you, but from an Arabic word that means to lend someone something, to let someone borrow something in, for a period of time in such a way that they have total free use of it. You know, it's different. It's one thing if Jared said, or if one of you asked, you tend to ask Jared now because his truck's a little better and a little bigger than my truck, but um, ask Jared for your truck, for his truck, and you say, can I borrow your truck? And he, would, he might, if he just says, absolutely, well, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. He doesn't even ask what for. He just says, you can have it. Have it until next week. It's fine. But if he were to say, well, for, what, what do you need it for? Then he's asking specifically, and that would be something different than this. This is a kind of borrowing where you just give it to them and just say, I don't need to see it or know what you're doing with it at all until such and such a time, and then I need it back. It's totally free for them to use however they want. Now, in the way that this word, if, if that's the Arabic background or whatever, and maybe it is, it doesn't really matter a whole lot to us, but the word in Hebrew, it's the same kind of thing, but it doesn't have the idea of, just borrowing. Instead, it's a gift. You just give it to them, and it's theirs to do with what they want. It's a gift or a tribute to them. And that word tribute is almost better here. <laughs> tribute. It's not just a gift. It's a tribute. And why do I say it? it's, even, it's not just a gift? It's a tribute. Um, because in passages that, where this word is used, where it's not related to the grain offering, it means specifically, every time I've seen it, a gift from an inferior to a superior. <laughs> Especially, almost, almost exclusively, from a subject to his king. Now that's very helpful as we're thinking about this. It conveys the idea of homage and of tribute. Here's a couple instances. When some of the Israelites despised Saul, they brought him no present, no gift, no tribute. Same word. They did not acknowledge him as their king or consider King Solomon and the foreign kings who would come and present him offerings or gifts or tribute. It's the same word. These gifts, then, were they all required to be blood offerings? Not at all. They were gifts to him, to honor him. These, pr these presents included items of silver and gold from some, robes, weapons, spices, horses, even mules. Even mules. The gifts that were given in homage were appropriate to the social status and the standing and the circumstances of the giver. So if you're a man from some country where your country is known for this great kind of mule, 
Well, you're going to bring to King Solomon what is the glory of your country? The mule. You're going to bring what you've got. You may remember one famous instance of this in the New Testament, where some magi came from halfway around the world to present a gift and tribute to the child king, the Messiah. This is the same thing. This is the, the same idea that we're talking about. Were they required to have a certain offering? No, it was what they wanted to give. But because of the nature of, what they're, of the act of paying tribute, it needs to be something good, something that they're proud of, something that they consider worthwhile, fit for a king such as they've traveled to see. Now all this to say, not only that the word is, is used um, of either the grain offering or a sort of tribute, but more than that, if Moses was trying to be clear about the fault in Cain's offering, being the fact that it did not have blood, there's lots of other words that he wrote in the rest of his books that he could have used that would have made that clear. He could have used any of these words for offerings that refer to a sin offering or a guilt offering or a blood offering or even a sacrifice, which could kind of refer to any of them. He, referred, he used this word grain offering or this word that's used later for grain offering or any other time it's used in the Bible, it's used as this kind of a tribute, gift. He used that word. Also, he doesn't mention, when he mentions the, the acceptance of Abel's off, offering, the blood. The blood is nowhere mentioned in this passage. The only blood in, in, in Genesis chapter 4 is the blood of Abel himself. So it wasn't about the blood. So I think a far better translation of the word in our passage would be gift or tribute. Now if you had read in verse 3, in the course of time Cain brought to the Lord a gift. You wouldn't be thinking, ah, he didn't have blood. That was the problem. You would think, he's, no, he's just coming to give a gift. Or he brought to the Lord a tribute of the fruit of the ground. That makes it clear that the issue is probably not one of blood. Now, I'd like you to turn with me to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. And the story of Gideon. Beginning in verse 17. And what I want to read here is to show you how this, the kind of offering that Cain presented can be very acceptable to God and can be used even in this context of giving homage to someone. Verse 17. Now remember, this is Gideon speaking now with the, the angel of the Lord who'd come to visit him. And he said to him, If now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who speaks with me. Please, so what's the sign? Please do not depart from here until I come to you and bring out my present my tribute, and set it before you. And he said, I will stay till you return. So Gideon went, in, now how long is he out there waiting? It, Gideon went into his house, prepared a young goat, a young goat, and unleavened cakes from an ephah of flour. Why unleavened? He doesn't have much time. He's trying to hurry. The meat he put in a basket, and the broth he put in a pot, and brought them to him under the terebinth and presented them. So I don't know how long it takes you to slaughter an animal, cut the meat out, cook it up, make a little stew, and make the bread and everything, and then get out. I mean, it was a favor almost to ask him, please don't leave until I come and I can present this gift for you. And the assumption almost was, I mean, you might think, well, how rude he's just out there waiting around. No, the angel of the Lord knew he's going to prepare a gift, a real gift for me. Give him some time. And he does. And the angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened cakes and put them, he didn't eat it, put them on this rock and pour the broth over them. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord reached out the tip of his staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes. And fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. 
Then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace be to you, do not fear, you shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it still stands at Orpha, at Ophrah, sorry, which belongs to the Abizrites. What a thing. So there he comes, present this. It's a, it's a, it's a food offering, it's a meal offering. He gives it to him in tribute, and the point even wasn't to eat it. It was just to offer it to him. Here's what I've done. Here's what I've made. It's the best I've got. Here it is. He says, set it on a rock and pour out all the stew, and I'll burn it up. It was simply a tribute. It was representative, signifying something in the heart of Gideon toward this traveler. Now back to our passage then. Um, in this whole text, we are meant, I think very obviously, and I'll point this out, to be comparing Cain and Abel, Cain and Abel, Cain and Abel. And let me show you one in indicator how that's the case. Um, back Continually we go from Cain to Abel, Abel to Cain, Cain to Abel, Abel to Cain, Cain to to Abel, Abel, to Cain. It's this way all the way through. Look here. Verse 1. She conceived and bore Cain. Then she bore his brother Abel. Next word, Abel was a keeper of the sheep. Cain, a worker of the ground. We just ended with Cain. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And then now we're Abel. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. The Lord had regard for Abel and his offerings. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. Back and forth between the two, we're meant to be making comparisons, to compare both the, the worshipers and the offerings. We're meant to compare and contrast. Now as we consider the way that Abel's offering is described and compare that to the way Cain's offering is described, I think we'll begin to see the problem with Cain's offering. So let's consider then Abel's offering. First of all, how is it described? And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock. The firstborn, it says. Then it says, from their fat portions, or from, from their fat portions, from their fat, of the firstborn and of their fat, he brought. The very best and tastiest and good burning portions, this is what he brought. The very best. That he had. It would seem that Abel believed that God was the Lord of the place. He came to really bring tribute. He thought of God as his rightful king, as the one who deserved his best. His heart was directed toward God as someone who wanted to express gratitude, to give him his best. Even though they were not in God's garden, they were in his world. They were receiving from his hand. And therefore, the choicest parts of what Abel had should be offered to the Lord in tribute and in homage to him. Abel seems to have made a good offering. He was accepted. It was a real tribute, as he was able to do. He took of what he had and offered God the best tribute he could. Cain's offering, however, has none of those good descriptions. It doesn't have those good descriptions. Think of that. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. That's all he brought. Some of the fruit of the ground. I would just say, can, are we really meant to ignore the fact, this fact that Cain's offering has none of these good descriptions in the midst of such a concise story? I don't think we can. I don't think we're meant to. We're meant to, we're, we're, he's showing us something. He's not telling us, he's showing us of the inferiority of Cain's offering by the superiority and the excellence of Abel's. There's no parallel to firstborn with first fruits, which is, we know that, the, I mean, if, if the firstborn is highlighted as a good thing, it ought to be the first fruits. God's not given the first share, not the first. Abel took first, then gave God gave the, some of the remaining to the Lord. 
There's no parallel to the fat portions that Abel had in his offering. Which would mean then that Abel took, I'm sorry, that Cain took the choicest of the produce for himself and offered the Lord leftovers as his tribute. He gave him some, surely. I mean, it wasn't maybe the worst he had, but it wasn't the best. He didn't, it, he didn't give him the best. Abel gave him the best. He didn't give him first. Abel gave him first. Now, this same understanding, these, picking up on these clues, was picked up by a lot of the rabbis, these Jewish readers of the Old Testament, the Jewish teachers. Some of them, however, inferred that Cain brought the very worst of his produce to the Lord. They went that far to say he brought the worst that he could to the God. I don't think that's very likely, and the reason I think it's not likely is because he was not there to insult the Lord. He, that's not why he was there, but to honor him. And more than that, probably to get something from him. I mean, if, you, if, you're, if, if a time comes and you're supposed to go and, and give a gift to this person, and your heart's not really in it, I mean, you, I mean, think about this. Let's say you get invited to a wedding of a distant relative, and you're, and you're going to go. There's the discussion between you and your wife or you and your husband. How much should we give? Well, I don't know. What do you think? Is, you think that's enough or what? You're, try, you're kind of more, how will they view what I give them? You know, I want, to give them, I want to give them something, but it's not really in your heart to just bless them as it is the same way. Someone who's near and dear and close to you, who you love, who you've had a hand in their marriage, they're getting together, and you want to do all that you can for them. It's all that difference. I mean, Cain comes and he brings some, something, that's fine. But Abel now, Abel brought the very best. Cain didn't. The point is, it was not the best that he could have brought. Now in the New Testament, if this is our understanding from the Old, we say, well, are we right in this? We'll find that our understanding of the two offerings being of different quality is confirmed. Consider Hebrews 11.4. Hebrews 11.4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. Now, I understand it was by faith that, that it, was off, it was accepted at all. But listen to just what it says. By faith, what did he do by faith? It doesn't say he was acceptable by faith. It says, by faith, he did something. By faith, some of these men put armies to flight. By faith, some received men back from the dead. By faith, Abel offered a, more, a better sacrifice. The sacrifice was better, substantively better than what his brother brought. Now, the reason it was better, the reason he thought to bring something better and to make a better offering was because of his faith. But his faith is what produced here a better sacrifice, a better sacrifice gift, a better offering. A better, a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. Through the, he makes the sacrifice, the, the gift, the offering, and he's commended through that as righteous. How was he commended? I mean, did you read anywhere in Genesis where he was commended? I didn't read anywhere where he was explicitly commended. The author of the Hebrews has learned some lessons from what Moses has shown him rather than what Moses has told him. What does he say? God commending him by accepting his gifts. That's, he was commended. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. What a thing. So this was Abel's offering. It was far better. Now then, the two worshipers. So now we've considered again these two offerings. We'll move on to consider the two men. First, consider the difference here in the way things are described. If you're back in Genesis, you notice that Abel, in terms of his character, he's not even... We don't really, we're not told anything about Abel's character directly. That's left largely undescribed. 
But his sacrifice was described in, ter in positive terms compared to Cain's. Cain's was just kind of un not described. Abel's was described in positive terms. In terms of Abel, the person, he's not really described, but Cain is described in negative terms. So on, on the one instance, what we're meant to, if you want to know what was wrong with Cain's offering, we'll look the, at the fact that it's contrasted with the greatness of Abel's offering. If you want to know what was right about Abel, consider the way he's contrasted with his evil brother, Cain. When it comes to the character of the two men, it is Cain's character that is described negatively, and Abel's is generally inferred from being the opposite of Cain's negative character. For instance, here's what I mean. If Cain and his offering were rejected for certain reasons, then we can, be safe, we can safely infer that Abel and his offering were accepted for being the opposite of those things. Cain was rejected because of this and this and this and this. Well, then Abel was accepted because of these other reasons. And the rest of the Bible does this same thing. How do we know that Abel had faith in God? I mean, how does the author of the Hebrews know that? How could he say that? Well, because he knows, the author of the Hebrews knows, that without faith it's impossible to please God. That is, we know something of what God is like, that God requires people to believe in Him and to come to Him and to think of Him as He is in some regard. And we know that Abel was accepted and approved by God. So we know this. We know that he had faith in God. We also can see the reasons why Cain was rejected. And we can know that Abel did not fall into those same categories. He wasn't the kind of man Cain was. Also, there is the broader context in Genesis in which Cain, we learn, is the first example of what we begin to see. That We begin to learn that the seed of the serpent isn't just the devil and his demons, but it's even fallen man. We begin to learn that. Who oppose uh, every form of true religion in the hearts of some men, the seed of the women. What a thing. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 12 tells us as much. 1 John 3, 12. We should not be like... Well, let me look at verse 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was the, of the evil one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Well, where was all that explicitly said in Genesis? It wasn't. I mean, he murdered him, but it wasn't. the reasons weren't told. We weren't told he was of the evil one, but we learn it. We see it. We begin to learn at this point. Abel wasn't that way. So what is said about Cain here? First, that he was unacceptable. This is kind of a, a play on words from, from an idiom here in the, in the Hebrew, but um, you might have a footnote uh, for um, verse 7. Mine says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? But literally it's just, will, will you not be lifted up? And the idea is Cain's face had already been, he'd already been crestfallen, his face had fallen. Now he says, won't you be lifted up? And the idea with this being lifted up is not just that he would be encouraged and take heart, but that would come from being accepted. So the first thing we're told about Cain is he was, the way he came was not acceptable. God had no regard for him. Second, he was not doing right. It says, if you do well, if you change and do well, won't you be accepted? Won't, won't things change for you? You're not doing right. Third, he was angry or angered. Why? Why? Because his brother's deeds were righteous and his were evil. That is, he was exposed, found out by God as not a, being a true worshiper. There for the wrong motives, the wrong reasons. Why was he there? Well, to get something from God. Not to honor God, but to get from God. Fourth, we're told he was in sin. And he was teetering on more of it. It says sin is there. If you, if you, look, if you do well... 
Won't you be accepted? But if you don't do well, sin's crouching at the door. Its desire is for you. But you must... Cain, you've got to stop the way you're going. You've got to rule over this. So he was in sin and was teetering on the verge of more of it. On the edge of a cliff that he didn't realize. Fifth, if we keep reading, we would see that there's much more that's negatively said about Cain. But I would just want to stop here so as not to run ahead of ourselves. Um, but there is one passage elsewhere in the Old Testament that I think sheds so much light on Cain and the rejection of both Cain and his offering. And that is a very famous passage that usually comes up in the, con well, at least this, this text and others like it from the same book, always come up in sermons on tithing. We're going to turn to Malachi chapter 1. Chapter 1, not chapter 3 where usually we hear about the, the tithing. But Malachi chapter 1. Be thinking of Cain, his offering, and his rejection. Verse 6. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests, who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? You can almost imagine Cain saying the same thing. By offering polluted food on my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. And then you might think, well, when would we say that? When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor? Says the Lord of hosts. I can stop there. You see how these offerings, some of these offerings that they were making, they weren't a sacrifice. They were an offering kind of of tribute. And he says, go try to present that to your earthly governor and see if he accepts you. And here you come bringing these things to me. What should they be to your earthly governor? The very best. And they're offering the lame and the poor and these things, and it's not right. And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure, he doesn't say, in your offerings, though that's true. He says, in you. No pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts. And I will not accept an offering from your hand. From the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name in a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted, and its fruit, that is, its food, may be despised. That is, you can just offer any old thing to God. He says, look, I'm determined my name is going to be great, and everywhere that my name is great, there will be great, pure, wonderful offerings made to me. And you guys come here with your heart attitude that's totally wrong, and you offer me these things, and you pollute my altar, and you despise the food of my table. Shut the doors. It's all a vain thing. Forget it. But you say, what a weariness this is. And you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence, what's been stolen, or is lame and is sick. And this you bring as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. Now that is a perfect commentary, I think, on the problem with Cain and his offering and the greatness of Abel and his offering. The reason he was accepted. He came with a heart intended to worship and to honor and to pay tribute to God. Abel did. And he, he in foresight of that, in premeditation, he prepared something fit for such a king. Cain, however, just brought some of his fruit, some of the produce of the land, and came. It was a light thing. He might not have come in saying it, but God knew it. He actually, the truth was he despised the whole matter. 
Just like these people said, well, how do we despise it? He says, well, look what you're doing. I can see by your actions you don't take this seriously. You don't, your not, heart's not toward me. The problem isn't, you see, the problem most fundamentally is in the heart. But that works itself out. I mean, the heart and the, the worshiper and his offering are one and the same. They're related. The man who's got it in his heart to give to God gives him all that he can. The woman who truly wants to serve God gives God everything she can, the best that she has, even if it's her last two pennies and it's beautiful to God. That's fine. But the, the man who's wealthy and who goes there and gives his little bit and thinks he's done something great compared to that woman is mistaken. She's put in more than all of them. It's not so much specifically what you give, it's what you're able to give and what you give. And Abel, or I'm sorry, and Cain did not bring his best, but Abel did. And so both Cain and his offering were rejected by God. God had no regard for them. It was a vain thing. What a play on words. I mean, Malachi says this thing is a vain thing. Who was Abel? What was his name? Vanity. What a thing. But he's the one who brought the acceptable, the substantive sacrifice. Cain was the one making a vain show. So here was Abel, accepted by God, as was his offering. Jesus says of Abel in Matthew 23 and verse 35. Jesus says, calls him the blood of innocent or of righteous Abel. Righteous Abel, he's called. He was doing what was right in God's sight. He was not in sin. And he was not teetering on the verge of more sin. He was seeking God. We read that text in Hebrews 11. Let me just read a few more verses from there. Start in verse 1. Hebrews 11. Now faith, what is faith? It's the assurance of things hoped for. You hope for something, confident assurance. I've been promised this by God. He's going to come to pass. He's going to bring it to pass. The conviction of things not seen. I'm not sure that these things are true because I see them worked out, but I believe that they're true. I'm convinced about them. That's faith. Now by it, by that kind of faith, people of old received their commendation. Something else about faith, he says. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. That's kind of a weird thing to put in this chapter, it seems to me. By faith, we understand that God made the world out of, thi that, out of things that are not s seen. Right? What is seen was not made out of things that are visible. It was made by the Word of God, created by Him. Knowing then that that is what faith, that one of the things we know by faith, that God made all of this, that we're in His world, that it belongs to Him. By that faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. That's the faith. And also by that faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. Enoch was walking around knowing he was in God's world, belonging to God as a servant of God, as a worshiper of God. That's what he was doing. And he was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists. That's, you kind of get that in verse 3. He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. Abel felt like it was a worthwhile enterprise to offer tribute to God. Because not only is, does He exist, not only is Abel there in God's world, but God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. Go for God. It's worth it. It's not a waste of your time. Abel believed that, or he wouldn't have been accepted. But Cain didn't. Cain was out there, godliness is what? A means of gain. That's Cain's idea. I'm out here to go get something from God. And then he's exposed, and he's angered by it. What a thing. There's one other clue to this same uh, attitude that Abel has in the text in Genesis, 
unfortunately, it's, I don't see it translated in any of, the, any of our English translations. And this happens in the New Testament a lot of times too in, with the Greek. But the, just to say that there is a word here that is emphatic. But when it says Abel came to offer his offering, so in the course of time Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel, he himself also brought of the firstborn. So it's not just that Abel brought it, but Abel even himself brought the offering. It's just an, that it's kind of underscored, and Abel really brought an offering to God. Just that it's emphatic there, and it's not with Cain. Cain came and he brought of the firstborn, but Abel now, he really sat down and intended to bring something himself to the Lord, and he brought the very best. And so there's this personal engagement that he has in the act. He's earnest, he's sincere, he's looking forward to his time to pay homage and tribute to the Lord. Again, the New Testament takes this up in Hebrews 11 as it treats Abel and even Enoch as examples of faith. These two men were thinking of God as their kind Lord and Creator. They were convinced that walking with God and seeking God was worth it. They were happy and glad to do it. Now then, I said there were three parts to this message. Looking at the offerings, the worshipers, we've looked at those things. Now then, God's pleading with Cain. God's pleading with Cain. Just consider this. The fact that God is pleading with him to repent is remarkable. What happened when Adam ate of the tree? That one sin, when Adam ate of the tree, what happened? Did God plead with him to turn around and it would all be all right? No, it was, he was punished. It was over. Not that God had no more dealings with him, but there was certain punishment to be carried out. There were judgments to be had. And that was the end of that era. But now Cain comes to make an offering to the Lord. He's not regarded for it because God knows what he's doing. And then Cain gets angry about it. His face literally gets hot. He gets hot about this. And his face fell, and God turned to him and says, Why are you angry? I and mean, he begins to plead with him, Turn. If you'll change, if you'll repent, won't you? I'll accept you. But you, have to, you can't come bringing me that. You need to come and really seek me. You need to come and honor me as, as I am. Don't treat me like, like this. This is incredible. The kindness of God. And he's not just cut off and cast away. After one time, God is pleading with him. Even Cain. And we can see him pleading with Abel over some small infraction. Abel was a righteous man, but here's Cain. God saying, no, come back, don't go. Cain had just been rejected by God, but God is not just done with him. When Cain responds with anger and with despondency, God seeks to turn him away from what would be the terrible result of his actions. Now somehow Cain thinks he's justified. And that somehow he's almost been wronged by God's approval of Abel, Abel and Abel's sacrifice. He's furious about it. And the Lord attempts to reason with him and to dissuade him from his course. Why are you angry? And why is your face fallen? The Lord seeks to encourage Cain to do right by assuring him that he need only to repent and come in the right way to be accepted. He needs only to turn his heart to feeling rightly about God and all will be well. And this is true because God's not a respecter of persons, that he should reject Cain for just being Cain. It's not like God has just said, well, I'm just going to accept Abel and I'm going to reject Cain regardless. If Cain would turn and act as Abel's acting, he too would be accepted. He just needs to change. I mean, he just needs to turn. God's not set his face against him. He's waiting for him to come in the right way, and he's giving him opportunity to come, and he's encouraging him to come. He's instructing him even about how to be accepted. He warns him. Not only, not only does he encourage him to do the right thing, but he warns him about not repenting. If he does not repent... It's only sin that stood in his way. It's nothing else. The only thing that would keep him from repenting is sin. 
And if he's not going to, return, going to turn away from sin, he'd have, God would have him know sin is out there, right outside the door, waiting to have him, crouching at the door like a lion, ready to pounce on its prey. In other words, if Cain does not repent now, sin's going to have him, and it's going to seek to master him, and upend him, and make things far worse than they are even now. And God's saying, don't. It's out right out there at the door. Don't go. Make right now. You've come to me to bring me this offering and I've, I've rejected it, but I'll have you know if you'll come in another way, if you'll repent now, if you'll confess your sin, you'll be accepted. But right at the door is sin and it's out there and it's going to have you out there. It's, mean, it's crouching at the door. It's lurking there for you. Its desire is for you, to have you, to control you, to destroy you, to possess you, to lead you to do its bidding, and to take you. But Cain, no, you must rule over it, he says. You must defend yourself and stand against it. Take this opportunity to repent, and your face will be lifted up. We could go on in the narrative, but... That's for next time. But let me say this. Beloved Cain, right here, is an example of the incredible power and destructive force of sin in the human race. That means potentially in your life, in my life, the life of our children, the life of our neighbors and our co-workers. Cain is an example of the incredible power and destructive force of sin in your life. Think of this. He showed up to worship God half-heartedly. And he left the occasion ready, willing to murder his brother. I mean, he turned on... He didn't answer God anything. He turns right around on his heels, walks out of there, speaks to his brother, gets out in the field and slays him. I mean, God Himself was pleading with him, don't sin. Don't turn. I'm warning you, this is, if you go on here, if you leave, if you, if you walk out of here now the way you are, this is what's going to happen. And he leaves. And sin pounces and has him. It's incredible. And what does he find himself doing? He goes straightway out into the field to kill his brother. God asks him again. He says, well, what, do you, I, what am I supposed to shepherd that shepherd? I mean, it's incredible. He's speaking to God in this way. Sin has, it's got him. It has possessed him. It's crouching at the door. It's desires for you, but you must rule over it. Well, he didn't. It took him. I mean, here you are maybe in your own life, in some situation of temptation, and you think it's isolated. It's, it's just... It's just about whether your offering was accepted or not. It's just about that. It's just God didn't accept you and you're upset about it. Something happened in your life and it's really not good and you've got a really bad attitude about it. God's dealing with you and you think, whatever, it's no big deal. I'm not going to deal with it. I'll go on like I am. And God, listen to what God's saying to Cain. Sin's crouching at the door. Repent now. It's going to have you. You can't have this attitude of just ignore it and act like it's no big deal. It's going to have you. You've got to, your attitude to this thing, you've got to defend yourself, you've got to fight, you've got to rule over it. Make war against this thing. You can't be comfortable with this. It's going to take you if you do that. And here's Cain killing his brother. And it's a testament to all of us that, I mean, it's cliche, right? Sin takes you farther than you want to go and all this kind of stuff. But it does. Cain didn't wake up ready to kill his brother. He wanted to get, he came thinking, well, this little thing I'm going to do for God will be enough and life's going to be good for me. And then he killed his brother because he wasn't willing to repent toward God about some other matter. Sin doesn't, it doesn't mean to have part of us a little bit. It's not just, well, it's this isolated thing over here. I got this pet sin that I'm kind of dealing with and it's just, it, that's all right. No, it's not. It's, it, sin's desire is to have you. And you must rule over it. Sin's a terrible danger. 
It's there crouching at the door and ready to pounce. And if men are generally of the kind, uh, if men are generally the kind of men who don't make war with that sin, well, that explains a lot about the world, doesn't it? <laughs> that explains a lot. If sin works in this way, and men generally don't make war against it, well, we shouldn't be surprised to find all sorts of manner of evil in the world. Of course evil exists. How could evil, how could, if God is good, how could evil exist? Well, because men are so unwilling to make war against it. That's how. Because he set men up in the world to rule, to exercise dominion, and they just let themselves be run by sin. Because they love it. Because they'd rather be slaves of sin than servants of God. Why do they get so angry? Because their deeds are evil and someone else's are righteous. They're exposed for their wicked hearts. Two texts just to close with in the New Testament. You may be thinking of these already. First Peter chapter 5, just a reminder. Peter says, be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. What a thing. There he is, prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. I mean, if I told you that right outside in the parking lot, there's a roaring lion, you wouldn't go out there with your eyes closed, walking around blindfolded, you know, trying to get to your car. You'd be watchful, be sober-minded. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith. It's the same kind of call that goes out to Cain. Listen, sin's crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you've got to rule over it. You've got to master this thing. Put it beneath your feet. And the only, the only, one other text that we'll close with then is Ephesians chapter 6. I may make brief comment on this, but I just intend to read it. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 20. Finally, this is addressed to Christians who have resources in heavenly places in, in Christ. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore. In what way should you stand if you're going to try to, having done everything, to still be standing? Well, you ought to stand this way, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To, this, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. I mean, every believer, it's not just, it's you, you are in this battle, but everyone, and he says, so we ought all to be praying for all the saints. And he says, and pray for me too, I've got a struggle too, I've got these battles, I'm put in situations as an ambassador for Christ, where I ought to speak the truth boldly, and it's hard sometimes. Pray that I would also conquer and succeed and advance and stand firm and having done all to still be standing at the last day. So I could get to the end and say, I fought that good fight. Beloved, it's this way for every Christian. Sin's crouching at the door. That's just its posture. It wants to have you. Cain did not think that he was going to kill his brother when this all started. But sin took him. 
He wasn't willing to deal with the sin he knew about, and so sin took him. He didn't resist it. It's a terrible danger, beloved. Well, that's by no means the only point of this passage, but I do think, again, it is that point of the text so far which Moses has offered as that which explains so much about the world we live in. It's the power and the posture of sin toward men and men's general, and as we, we're going to see, men's refusal, mankind's refusal to deal with it the way God tells them to. That will explain so much of the evil in the world. All right, are there comments or questions about this today? I know we've gone a little long, um, and uh, it's been a little bit more involved maybe than some other times, but... Uh,